and some of you may have met Joseph Clark, some not, he is new to our University Counseling Office this academic year, um, and so we'll be doing a lot more of the applications from here onwards. Um, before we start, can I just see what year groups your children are in? Um, year, year 10? 12. 12. 7. 8. Nine. Okay. okay, so, yeah, so, so 7 till 12. Very yeah. far ahead. And then this is all happening to you now. Yeah. Who's your child, sorry? Only me. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so you've also met. Yeah. Okay, um, Jay's going to start off by giving a bit of context about kind of different universities in the US and starting to research them, and then I will talk more about the actual application process in the second half. Yeah. I'm just plugged in. Okay, so yeah, first, first up, the, these are the places that students have applied to and received offers from in the last seven years. So um, obviously up at the top, we've got the Ivy Leagues. We've got Cornell, Yale, UPenn, Brown, Dartmouth, Princeton, Harvard. Um, we have received offers and had students go to many of these schools. Um, public universities, some of the big ones, um, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, for example, uh, UCs, which are uh, public universities, University of California, um, some good offers from there. Then private universities, Stanford's probably the best known of those, but there's a, a lot of other uh, big universities in that area. Seven Sisters, I'll talk more about these uh, groupings, the names of the groupings as we move on. Um, top liberal arts colleges and art schools. So. Um, We've got a good track record of getting uh, students into strong US schools. So <clears throat> although the majority of our students do apply to the UK, we've got, in, we've got solid numbers applying to the US and getting into good places. So um, this is a little comparison because uh, I don't know how familiar you all are with the US and the UK. Um, some of you might have had sons and daughters going through before, but these are the differences between them. So in the UK, there's 130 uh, degree awarding universities. In the US, there's over 4,000. So it's a huge difference, a huge amount of research and that, that can be done and amount of information to absorb when you're looking at all the institutions. <clears throat> the UK is done through one central system. So we do it all through UCAS, where you choose five universities and then once you've got all your offers, you go uh, for your safety, your insurance offer, and your firm offer. In the US, you can apply to as many as you want to. We have a little star there, because <laughs> you might want to apply to 400. That's not feasible. You might want to apply to 100. That's not feasible. You have to write essays for each university. I know, well, most students don't like writing essays that much, that they would want to do that. It would also dilute the quality of the essays that you're writing. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the amount that we advise later on. Obviously, it's it dependent on the student. And if they have good reasons for applying to places, then that's we, we will support their application. Um, UK, we have A-levels, personal statement, a reference written by myself or Ms. Pohl uh, in conjunction with the tutors and all their academic um, all their academic teachers, and then IELTS or TOEFL, increasingly IELTS for UK universities. US applications, sometimes you receive um, credit for A-levels. A-levels are held in very high esteem around the world because of the depth of the study, and that's one of the reasons we, uh, as a school, have chosen to, to, to do A-levels traditionally. Um, in some US schools, you get college credit for your A-levels if you achieve a certain grade. So if you've got uh, straight A's, for example, you might have to take one course less in your first year, or it varies depending on the school, and that's part of the research that, you'd, that we'd be encouraging your, your child to undertake and that we'd be helping them with when they're doing their applications to see if they could get any credit. Um, often they require SATs and SAT subject tests. Um, it is not every college that requires them. Some will require... Uh, the ACT, uh, but most will say SAT or ACT. Some don't require either, and you can get in with your A-levels alone. They will give credit for that. It, it Again, it really varies depending on the school. Um, 
personal essays. Generally, there will be through the Common App, which we'll look at again in, in a little bit, uh, you will need one personal essay. And it really differs from the personal statement. The personal statement is 80% academic. The personal essay is about you as a person. So they'll want to know you're a good student, but that will come from the SAT scores, the A-level scores. They'll want to know something about you. The American colleges look for something about you as opposed to uh, UK colleges which look for a more just the academic. There will also be academic elements within uh, what we call su supplementary essays and each college will ask for a certain amount of those and again it varies. Some of the IVs will ask for six, seven, eight, some will ask for one. It, it depends massively depending on the school. Um, a counsellor reference again from myself or Miss Pohl which again has a, a, a slightly less academic uh, emphasis than the UK version. Then we need two letters of recommendation from teachers. So um, that will be coordinated by myself and Miss Paul, but your child will need to think about who they would want to write those references. Um, sometimes they'll ask us for two people and we'll actually say maybe you should think about having this person write one because we know the style that they write, that our teachers write in. So to give a fuller picture of the student, we'd ask for someone else to write it, because they might write two very similar things. Um, and again, you'll need IELTS or TOEFL. So UCAS, we manage the application. For the US, we, it's managed by the student, but we support them. We work together. Not all colleges use the common application form, um, and there'll be individual applications to colleges. Again, we will support, but it'll have to be sent by the student themselves. Um, UK degrees are three years generally, although there are some which are four years. Uh, liberal arts and generalized undergraduate degrees are four years in the States. So when we're looking at fees, from US 23,000 to 40,000 in the UK, 20,000 to 48,000 in the US. So very similar, but bear in mind there is an extra year that, you'll have to, that, that they'll be studying. Um, however, very few scholarships available in the UK. There are not a lot of scholarships in the US, but there are more scholarships available in the US, both for merit and uh, needs-based. So when we talk about the 4,000 4, institutions, these are how they're broken down. Two-year colleges. Uh, there's community colleges and junior colleges. Public are owned by, either, by the state. Private are owned by... Um, they're run as businesses. <coughs> um, when we talk about college in the US, it's slightly different to the UK definition of a college. So, in the UK, when you go to do your degree, you're going to university. A college would be where you would do your sixth form studies. Um, or equivalent, so 16 to 18 generally. In the US, a university is a, a university that offers postgraduate studies. A college doesn't necessarily, do, well, doesn't offer postgraduate studies, but it will offer a degree. It's an, a, a degree awarding institution. So a liberal arts college, for example, will give a bachelor's degree. State colleges will give bachelor's degrees. In the UK, colleges don't give degrees. They're for getting into university. We will often use the terms interchangeably because we're accustomed to degree awarding institutions <laughs> being called universities. So we'll say, oh, you're, going, you're doing your U US university applications. It's just terminology. It means the same thing, just to, just to be clear. So research universities, are, make up a small proportion of the US institutions and they can often be far larger than the uh, state colleges and liberal arts colleges. Liberal arts colleges in particular are often very small, under 5,000 people. State colleges can be as many as 70,000 plus. So it's, it's partly what, which of these will work for your son or daughter, 
will depend on what type of person they are, well, what type of institution they want to be in, what type of surroundings they want to be in. Some people can get lost amongst 70,000 people. Some people like that big community feel. Um, some people will feel isolated in a, in a college, in a gr matriculating class of 200. They, they'll feel this is too small. Like this, uh, I feel, uh, you know, I, I want to be somewhere where there's more um, facilities, for example. So the bigger universities tend to have flashier facilities because they have lots more students paying fees. They have more students who've graduated and given them money. So therefore, uh, their facilities can often be very impressive. So just to clarify, colleges offer only undergraduate programs. They have smaller classes. Uh, it's a close faculty and student interaction. And there are research and mentoring opportunities. Um, one of the things about a college is because they are not research institutions like the universities with a great deal of uh, postgraduate um, research, the emphasis is on the teaching. So you generally have a closer relationship with the uh, lecturer, tutor, who would uh, help support the student and they'd have closer personal relationships. With the university, they offer undergraduate and graduate programs, more large lectures, um, the facilities are usually a bit more expansive, and there's big time sports. So I don't know if any of you watch US college sports, but it is enormous. You'll get 100,000 people at a game. Uh, for some of the big football games. Um, the basketball and the football is just off professional standard and sometimes it's even better supported. It is phenomenal. Um, the key from our point of view and what we're going to work with you guys towards is finding the right course at the right university. Not necessarily going for place with a big name because if your son or daughter doesn't enjoy it there it's not the right place if it's not the right fit for them it's not right um, we want to think about all the factors that would influence them which would make them choose a university and and work towards finding the right one so a few terms which might be unfamiliar liberal arts education. So a liberal arts education carried out by liberal arts colleges, also by some of the other institutions which talk about a liberal arts ethos. Put simply, a liberal arts education is a broad uh, field of study. You will look at various different subjects as part of your degree. Um, you'll generally be awarded a bachelor's degree at the end and most, most of the colleges will be quite small and have small student numbers in each class. Um, with the range of study, it's based on the idea of a liberal education, which is that people should be aware of lots of different areas of knowledge because they all feed in together. So a, a kind of holistic education, bringing everything in uh, because of the, they would argue that you can't be a really good scientist without understanding philosophy and ethics. You can't be um, a good journalist without understanding science and economics. And bringing all these things together, you still have a major at the end, but you will have a broad liberal arts education. And um, they will generally have more credits given across a wider range of courses than at some of the other universities where you'll do majors and minors, but uh, there'll be more of a focus on the majors. An example is Dartmouth, where I like to explore big ideas, and this is from their website, they explore big ideas and pursue particular passions. Um, engage with culture and compassion of the humanities, the creativity and passion of the arts, and the critical thinking of the social sciences. So you have to take 35 courses to graduate. 
I said, that's a lot if you think they're taking <laughs> A-level four courses over two years, 35 courses over three years, four years, sorry. Um, and they need to come from arts, international comparative study, literature, traditions of thought, social analysis, natural and physical sciences, quantitative and deductive sciences, and technology or applied sciences, as well as looking at non-Western cultures, Western cultures, and culture and identity. So it's integrating all that knowledge, bringing everything together. That's the purpose of uh, a liberal arts education. This is a really useful resource for teaching you more about that, if, if your child's interested in liberal arts education. Um, Colleges That Change Lives started off um, as a book written by a college counsellor, and it's now supported by a number of the liberal arts colleges. So there's about, I um, can't remember the exact number, between 40 and 50 colleges support this website, and it helps you to find out about what their curriculums are, what they offer, and uh, it focuses very much on liberal arts. So it, it, how, uh, it can be a really useful resource for students who are interested in studying liberal arts, who want to know what college to go to, because there's so much choice. There, is, there are so many. So, um, so we looked at the liberal arts programs. These are probably universities you've all heard of, uh, the Ivy League. Um, we Basically, the Ivy League is a, a group of private universities in the Northeast, in um, what's generally termed New, New England. Um, they're highly selective, highly selective. So if students are applying to the Ivies, we would also recommend that they have a safety school, a good safety school, because if you look at the overall admission rate, it's very low, and these are, it's only top students who are applying here. So uh, they're hugely competitive. Um, I would ask you to notice, though, that the early decision and early action admission rate is far higher. So early admission and early action is um, when you commit early to applying to that school, you say, if you offer me a place, I'll go to you. So early decision is that, early action is slightly different, but um, Ms. Paul will cover that later on. Um, it basically requires your son or daughter to be very organized so we can get an application off by the beginning of November. General admissions, the deadline's January the 1st. If you commit early, first of all, it shows them that you're a diligent student who is interested in going to their university. They therefore treat those applications um, slightly better than they do the other applications because they think, okay, this person's committed, this person's organized. Um, we know that this person wants to go to us. We have a certain number of, college, of spaces to fill. We can do that. So, Ivy's key to be organized early. Um, other thing that is important, if you look, SAT scores, they are very high out of, uh, out of 1,600. So we're looking at towards the top end. ACT, um, again, very high range. The other thing to think about is um, when, we're, when our, we're doing our research and the, the students are looking at which school they want to go to, there's a really different ethos and emphasis at each of these different schools. For example, um, UPenn got a famous um, business school, uh, which is one of their sort of main focuses, whereas um, Columbia, more history, economics, uh, would, would be the areas they'd be focusing on. So it, the ethos and the subject specialty will change for each of these. The other thing to note is that um, for the particularly competitive courses, these admit rates are even lower <laughs> and these SAT ranges are even higher. So if you're looking at engineering at one of the Ivies, you need to be performing right at the top of the SAT bracket because um, they are hugely competitive. 
outside of the ivies, there's the seven sisters. So the seven sisters were traditionally uh, women's private colleges. Um, Vasa is now co-ed, so it's still called one of the seven sisters despite that. Um, Radcliffe has merged with Harvard College. Uh, but these have a traditional affiliation with uh, the Ivies. So Barnard College, for example, um, you can take dual classes with Columbia. So they, uh, although they aren't uh, Ivy League, they are hugely competitive, hugely... Um, and, we, we, and they offer a huge, uh, hugely competitive degree. So the Seven Sisters are uh, a good option, mainly for your daughters, but perhaps your sons at Vassa. Um, outside of the Ivies and the Seven Sisters, we've got the Big Ten. These are the big research universities in their states. Um, they have a lot of students who go there. Uh, they, again, they're, very com they're still very competitive and they are, again, have their own areas of specialty. So, um, University of Michigan, uh, Penn State, a lot of the, sort of Michigan State, a lot of the bigger name public universities. Then you've got the Hidden Ivies. Uh, people say that these schools are, well, people often say that these schools are as good as the Ivies in terms of the education that they offer, uh, they're just not as well known. They don't have the traditional reputation. They're not as uh, established historically. But if you look at some of, some of the names there, you'll have heard of Duke, uh, John Hopkins, Stanford perhaps. Um, they are, and you can see some of the Seven Sisters are in there as well. They are really top schools. Um, again, the acceptance rate is not particularly high. So Stanford is not like this uh, the exact I, I don't know the exact acceptance rate for Stanford. It's very it's it's not Yeah, it's it's competitive. Yeah. Um, I need the public Ivies. So these are Ivy League academics at public school prices, straight from their marketing brochures. Um, <laughs> College of William Mary, Miami University, uh, the UCs, University of Michigan, etc. So, uh, really strong academic schools, public school prices. So, public school pr prices are generally lower because they're subsidized by the state. Um, the private schools, generally a bit higher. So just looking specifically at some of those, these are the universities of California. So a lot of our students are interested in the UCs, partly because California is an appealing place to live. It's nice and hot like Thailand. You don't have to brave the cold and uh, the, some of the winters they've had up in Boston and uh, New England recently. So these are very appealing. Something that is worth noting is that California is enormous. Um, it's a, about the same size as the UK. So when people say, oh, I'm applying to the UCs, San Francisco and San Diego are a flight apart. They're a long, long way away. Uh, if you're putting out big, broad applications, you need to think about what type of lifestyle you want. If you're applying to California for the beach surfer lifestyle, don't apply to UC Davis. It's three hour, two hours from the beach, three hours from the beach inland. It's, there's a lot of different things to, cons to consider, which is why we really encourage students to speak to university visitors when we have them in about what the campus life is like, and then to thoroughly research. Like we will assist them with their research, but again, it's, there's, there's only so much that we can say, because it it'll be easier for them to research to find out what they like. Again, these colleges all have different specialties. So UCLA, uh, very popular, music engineering, economics and psychology. Berkeley, known for engineering, architecture and business. So just kind of weighing up what you want, where you want it from. 
again, very competitive, but it varies according to the uh, to the school. So, Berkeley, seven percent international acceptance rate. UCLA, fourteen percent international acceptance rate. San Diego, it's a bigger school, lets more people in. Doesn't quite have the. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very famous name, a very good school, but it's not quite got the prestige of Ber uh, Berkeley or UCLA. 33%. So you, if you go to one of the uh, less, if you apply to the less well-known ones, even though the GPA is very similar, the ACT score is very similar, the SAT score is very similar, the standard of education is very similar, the odds of getting in are better. So this is part of the research that we're going to encourage, we will encourage your students, to, uh, your children to do, and um, that we'll assist them with. Okay, rankings and league tables. Um, this is often the first port of call when you're starting to research a school, and um, they can be very useful. We'd encourage you to take them with a pinch of salt and treat them with caution, just because, as we've said before, we're looking for the best fit for your son or daughter. The best fit isn't necessarily just that it's number one. The best fit is to do with all these things and a lot more. It's about the personality of your child and, and where they can thrive and get a good degree. Because a top degree from a university ranked number 20 is better than dropping out of the university rank number one. So we want to find somewhere where they can really achieve their best. And that's what the uh, US app admissions process is all about from the, from the college side as well. So they look at students who they think are going to do well, and that's why they ask so many questions about their personality, to see who fits with their school. Um, these are the factors that they assess within the uh, rankings and league tables. And when you are looking at rankings in league tables, these are the ones we'd suggest that you kind of focus on. The US News, Forbes, and Washington Monthly. Um, they take into account staff-student ratio, entry standards, um, how well the students do academically, student satisfaction, etc. Um, these are all measures which will be important to your students, to, to your ch child's education. So that's why uh, we say these are the, the, the better of the ranking systems, but they're, again, please just take them with a pinch of salt, tread carefully with them. So when it comes to choosing a college, we need to think about what their chosen field is, what area they want to specialise in, um, how good the institution is, and how good that faculty is within that institution. So if you've got a, a school that is weak in one area um, but has a good reputation generally, it might not be the best place to go to study economics if, if that's the area that you're looking at. Um, accreditation, admissions requirements, cost, cost varies. It can be, you know, we looked at 20,000 to 48,000 a year. That's $28,000 a year potential difference in terms of uh, the costs. Over four years, that's over $100,000. Um, financial support, again, varies hugely. The number of uh, scholarships and the, the size of scholarships vary hugely from, uh, from institution to institution. Their size, location, climate, as we've already alluded to with the, uh, the temperature in parts of the states at the moment. Um, and housing. Is accommodation on campus? Is it near campus? Is the public transport? Uh, do they need to buy a car? All these extra expenses and things that you'd have to consider. So, <clears throat> school policy advises seven US choices. Within the choices there should be insurance opt options. So we advise reach, you know, if you've got a dream school, go for it. Match, something that matches your academic profile and your personal profile, and insurance, something that, because a lot of these schools are so competitive, we need to have something that can back up. Seven is not we're, not, we're not limiting them if they want to do more applications, but seven is our advice, particularly if they're a
Well, if they're applying just to the US, then we'd say 10. And the reason for that is, as I said at the start, we're trying to keep the standard of applications high. We want all of their essays to be well considered and, well, and uh, to the best of their ability to show the best of the student. But we don't want, um, we, we also don't want it to affect their studies because all of this has to happen in one term. It all has to, there's a couple of deadlines which come after the January 1st deadline, but very few. So everything has to happen by Christmas. If you're setting yourself up with 20 colleges, that's at least 20 essays. At least 20 essays. <clears throat> along with a study, along with, hopefully not, but potentially resits in October, um, potentially SATs in October, if uh, depending on um, how many sittings they've managed to do before, all those things. So it's, uh, that, that's, that's our advice. We're not sticklers. If you can give us a just, if the child can give us a justification of why they want to apply to this school, this school, this school, this school, and they can convince us, and we're not that hard to convince. We're quite flexible. Um, then that's fine. Finally, because there's so many institutions, it can be really hard to draw up a list of which colleges you want to apply to because. Um, it's like when you go to a restaurant and there's a 20 page menu. How do you decide what you're going to eat? If you've got this many, it's really hard to decide. Um, it's useful to look at universities overlap, so similar schools. Um, helps you narrow your search and may help throw up some suggestions you haven't thought of. So if they're looking at liberal um, arts college, something like the Colleges That Change Lives website will really help with finding about this overlap. Uh, speaking to the counsellors, speaking to myself, Miss Pohl, um, speaking to um, universities when they come in, saying, finding out where the overlap exists. So these little groups we've got here are examples of um, types of overlap. So it, that type of thing can really help um, with deciding exactly where you want to go. Ms. Paul. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now they've gone through the whole research process. They've decided where they're going to apply to. They need to start applying. Um, the US application has lots of different elements to it. So if your uh, child is applying to the US, they do need to be organized and they work very closely with us. There are a number of uh, parts of the application that are driven by the student with our support and there are a number which are organized by the school and they all come together to produce one application. The school profile is produced by us and provides the context of where the student is coming from. This is all part of the main application. Then each particular college will have their own supplement requirements. So they will all, they will all have all of these and then have specific extra parts. And those extra bits vary massively from university to university. So when um, Joe was talking about the size of the list that they're applying to, one of the factors that we will look at with them is what are the supplement requirements. So, um, for example, Brown requires five extra essays of 400 words each. That's a lot. Um, and then Boston University, for example, has um, one longer essay, that they, additional longer essay they have to do, which is, they're very complex titles, they take a long time, they're not so much about them, they're, they give them kind of quotes from philosophers and say, you know, what would you do with this, so it takes a lot of thought. And then on top of that, they have ten very quick answers, so in one word, would you, and then ten of those. So they vary massively in style and size, and then some will say, for supplements we just want a few quick information questions and that's it. So it's looking at what they're all 
asking for as well when deciding how many to apply to. And then mid-year reports, final certificates come from us throughout the year. Um, so once they've applied to the universities, around February time, we are required to send updated transcripts if there's any updated predicted grades, if they've done any resits they will take that into consideration, which is different to most other systems which just take what they've applied with. Um, the US application has a different emphasis. It's not purely academics. What they are looking for, this was explained um, in this terminology by uh, an admissions teacher from the States that seemed to make a lot of sense. It's, it's the story of the student. And all the different parts of the application are working together to provide an overview of who this student is in their place in the world, in their place in their school, in their place at the university. Um, and so that's what uh, Joe was talking about when we t work with them about the different letters of recommendation. We have the overview to ensure that one overall cohesive story about that student is going. So that the different letters of recommendation are complementing themes that we see in their personal essays, for example and there's not too much repetition. If most of their supplements have been focused on the community service that they do and they're very community minded, but then none of the letters of recommendation mention anything to do with that, that doesn't seem like a cohesive story about the student. So we work very closely with them to, the students go on quite a personal journey of discovery. You know, who are you? What do you stand for? What is important to you? And how can we reflect that in your application? Um, early decision, early action, so these are the deadlines. The US has lots of different deadlines. As a general rule, the earlies are the 1st of November, and then regular is 1st of January. Um, early decision, as Joe mentioned, is binding. They can only apply to one early decision school, and they sign an agreement when they send the application off. You as a parent will also get an email for a form to sign and we have to as well saying if you admit me to this school I will withdraw all other applications worldwide and definitely come to you. Um, so early decision we don't recommend if a student is applying to more than one country because they won't have all their offers on the table. Early action however is not binding they can apply to several early action schools and they get their reply earlier they get their reply in December which can help them make decisions of how many other schools they want to apply to or not. It can help them manage. We often have students apply to some early action and then some regular and a mixture of both. Um, the regular decision, although it's the 1st of January, because we have to work so closely with the students, really it's kind of the 1st of December so we can finish it off before the Christmas holidays. Um, I'm sure you don't want to spend your Christmas break running around trying to help them do essays and they're trying to email us and we're in different time zones and trying to help them. It just becomes a bit messy so we try and have everything done before the Christmas so they can relax and have a break and actually emotionally that term one of year 13 which you will experience next year is really intense and by Christmas they need a break so that they can come back refreshed and focus on their A-level exams having drawn a line under the applications. Most will use the common application, which makes it easier when they do. It's a centralized application system. Um, however, there are a number of schools that don't use the common app, in which case they will have their own online application forms. Um, sometimes they require things sent by DHL, by post and really old school. Sometimes it's online. So they all have different systems, so we work closely with the students to manage, to manage those. Um, they will need to take for the... In the, in the majority of cases, an admissions test, SAT, 1 or the ACT. There are an increasing number of schools that are SAT or ACT optional for international students. Um, there's about 400 very good ones on the list at the moment. Um, and so if students have done really badly on their tests, if it's all gone wrong or it's just one thing too many for them to manage, there are options. It's, it doesn't count out the US completely. However, if they have SAT and ACT, it does obviously widen their options. Um, the SAT2s, if you hear us referring to, these are subject tests. So the SAT1 is the overall admissions test and then in addition, some schools will require SAT subject tests. Not all, but if they are looking at the most competitive schools, 
they will be looking at having subject tests as well. If they take the ACT, they can also take SAT subject tests if they want to, but they don't need to. And the SAT2 subject tests, they should be looking at subjects that they're taking for A-level because there is overlap there, particularly in the maths and sciences. If they are a humanities student, the subject tests do become a little bit more problematic because literature is taught in a very different way to A-levels. The history tends to be US history, which they don't, haven't covered here. Um, so we work with them on that. But they are not needed for most universities, and universities know they're doing A-levels and they respect the A-levels. It's just for kind of the very top tier ones will be looking for them. Um, between SAT and ACT, it comes down to personal preference, really, um, and also logistics. Um, for you with much younger students, children, sorry, I wouldn't worry about deciding which one yet. They should not be doing test prep when they are in year eight. They have plenty of that to come later. However, um, you said your child was in year 10? Um, so they don't need to start now, but possibly looking towards the end of year 11, that summer holiday between when they finish their GCSEs and they have that bulk of time, starting to look at the test press then um, and look at the SATs in that summer block so that they are ready to take it for the first time during year 12 for their practice one. So in year 11, start looking, start looking at it. Um, the biggest thing for our students is purely logistical, is booking the tests in advance. Um, the test agencies have not been very kind to international students in the last couple of years. Um, both SAT and ACT um, in the last 18 months have cancelled international test dates on kind of three weeks notice with no replacement test date. Um, they get an SAT has reduced from six dates a year to four dates a year for international students and they get very very booked up um, an ACT now I've only got the ones before the summer because after the summer they are moving to a computer based testing system and they haven't released any dates yet which is not very helpful for planning in advance for our students um, these test dates get full very 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 quickly um, we are an SAT test centre. We are looking to become an ACT test centre, but with the change to the computer system, they are being very, they're withholding a lot of information. There's a lot of schools that are going, we just don't know what we need to do, being completely honest with you, so we're not sure what's happening with ACT at the moment. Um, we are an SAT test centre. However, we only have so much control. So um, earlier this year, for example, the, I think it was the October test date was when they shut Asia, essentially. Um, it was full. Normally when it's full, so for, this is next week, for May it's already full, but there is an option that they can say, let College Board choose my centre. They can put Harrow as a preferred choice if they're a registered student here. And at that point we can normally make sure they, they do sit it here. But the October one, it was about three weeks before, it was quite a while before, a month before, um, they stopped us being allowed to do that um, and they said Thailand was full. They wouldn't let anybody register for Thailand, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Indonesia, Singapore, just that's it. But with no additional test seats. Um, so they need to register early. Um, panic, cry a little bit. Uh, we, we've had a lot of, there's been a lot of uh, communication with the colleges from the school side and the professional organis councillors organisation that we are members of the globe has done a lot of lobbying with the universities of this year, this particular cohort, the ones in year 13 now, they were the ones that had all the test dates cancelled as well and then it was too full so lobbying for them to be a little bit more lenient with test scores from international students this year because contextually they have had an unfair disadvantage. Um, so I think we will start to see that. We're, most of, most of the uh, decisions are coming out this month so we will see what's happened with that. But there's a big global international movement to say, hey, hang on, you need to be fair to our students. So we do everything we can. We work with other schools. When the ACT cancellation, we um, NIST 
opened up to offer a, a few more of our students extra places from the test schools. So we do everything we can. The biggest thing, though, and it won't become a problem if they've registered as soon as they're able to register. Um, so as I said, now May, you know, we're beginning of March. Um, the May registration has been open for a month. Um, nearly all our students, and there's one more who wants to sit it in May, they've already registered and they've got their place at Harrow. So it's just planning in advance. It's really bad if the it's bad for the student if they're two weeks before going, oh, actually, I did want to sit that and I haven't, I haven't registered. That's when we're in a bit more of a difficult position and can't help them. So it's planning in advance, looking at what the test dates are and going, okay, I know in a year's time I'm going to sit it. So um, for your child, when they get to year 11, thinking when they're in year 12, are they going to want to have a go at the March one? because the May one is coming up to their AS level results. So do they want to sit it in March for the first time as a kind of practice run, see what their scores are, and then sit it again at the beginning of year 13? Or do they want to try and do it twice in year 12 so they don't have to worry about it in year 13, and having that plan ahead of time? When they are in sixth form, they can... Yes. Any result that they've done. Yes, the best one. They, yeah, it's fine. For uh, year 12 or year 13, so don't take it in year 10 or year 11, year 12 or year 13. So for two years. Um, they also don't have to declare all their results. They can choose which ones they send. So with IGCSEs, ASA levels, they have to declare all the exams that they've sat, even if they don't like the results. But for SATs, they can choose which one they send. So they can take one in March when they've done just a bit of preparation to see where they are, go through, get the feedback on which sections have gone well, and choose not to send it to their school. And then take it a second time and send that score if they want to. When they get into sixth form, um, as well as choosing their A-level subject options, they can opt into SAT support classes. We offer support classes for SAT here at school. Okay. Yeah. So we offer SAT support as a subject in school in sixth form. So they might be taking English, history and geography and then have one SAT class on their timetable as well. We offer SAT English and SAT maths. So if they wait until sixth form, they get a lot of support. Um, English proficiency, they will need to take IELTS or TOEFL. Um, these are just different English proficiency tests. Again, it just comes down to personal preference. Uh, TOEFL is computer-based, IELTS is paper-based. Um, if they are applying to more than one country, they should take IELTS because there's a number of countries for visa regulations as opposed to universities. So UK, for example, that you cannot get a visa with TOEFL. You have to use IELTS. So um, if they're applying to more than one country, we suggest IELTS. If they're just applying to the US, either is absolutely fine. Um, the TOEFL can be a bit easier in terms of sending the scores to the schools because they will only take the scores from the testing agencies, not from us. And TOEFL, you can send them online, whereas IELTS, you have to go down to, into Bangkok in person and fill out the form and, and send it. Um, so it's just something to have on the horizon. Um, and it's something that they, Alibi will need to take it before he applies, not afterwards. Yeah. Unless they have a US passport or a British passport, an English speaking country passport, they will have to take this. It's not hard, they just have to do it. <laughs> um, and again, these are valid for two years, so they can take it any time in year 12 or year 13. Um, so what are US universities looking for when they're looking at the applications? How are they going to choose who to admit? They do look at the context of each student. When they're looking at their scores and their achievements, they look at what environment they have been. Um, and so if they say, Oh, I've, I've done lots of MUN conferences. And then they look at our school profile, they see that we're an international school um, with high academic standards. They'll go, okay, well that's great, lots of people do MUN. It's quite easy to do it at your school. What else have you done with it? So then they would be looking, these are more competitive schools. So great, you've done MUN, 
but it's quite easy for in your school if they say um, I was very involved with MUN I have chaired two conferences I've done training sessions with lower students down the school to help train them up I've taken a leading role okay then that's more impressive within the context of your school I yeah. sports. yes sport is very yeah sports um, what the US is looking for is not that they've done a bit of everything they want to know that they're well rounded but then they want to know what they've done with that. So if they're really involved with sports, do they just show up to practice each week and just enjoy running around? Or have they actually taken a leadership position within the team? Have they looked at building team spirit? What have they done with that? Have, you know, what, what have they done within the opportunities they've been given rather than just taking those opportunities? Um, they're looking for a compelling story. They want to read the personal essay and go, oh, I really want to meet this person. They're looking for that personal voice. Um, and then they're also looking for best fit. Are they going to fit at my school? Do they think in the same way? You know, do I want to teach them? Do we want to have them in a class? Can we see how they're going to get on? Um, and it's worth noting with the US universities that they select a whole class. So if you look at UK admissions or Hong Kong admissions or Canadian admissions, they just look at the each individual. They go, right, can they survive on this academic course? Will they, be, will they get a good degree? Fine, they can have a place. With the US, they wait until they have lots of applications and then they create a class like an orchestra. You know, they want to make sure they've got an equal uh, gender balance that they have a number of different countries represented, that they have so many scientists and so many humanities-focused students, that they've got um, a group of students that they know are going to be very active in community service, that they've got the sports people that they want. You know, if, they've, if their quarterback from their football team is graduating that year, they know they're going to need more, so they might have a few more quarterbacks that year, for example. And they do create a whole class and so sometimes students won't be successful without really understanding why and it might just be because they had an awful lot of similar students apply that year. Equally, sometimes students don't quite have the academic profile and we thought it was a bit of a reach but they get straight in because they had something that they were looking for that year which is why they do apply to more universities in the US because sometimes we don't know what it is that they're looking for. And that's why it's so important that they are really honest in their applications and present who they are because they'll be chosen for that and it means there's a place for them where they will be able to thrive and be encouraged to be that version of themselves that they want to be. Um, so how are they assessing it? It's, with all that in mind, they are going to look at grades first. Um, they kind of go through the application process like hurdles do you get on to the next step? So the first thing they will look at, the first read was, do they have the academics to thrive in this environment? And if it's a no, they don't read the rest of the application. It's, can we look at it? And if it's a yes, then they go on the next pile, and it's kind of a blank, sh blank slate again. Then from everybody we've got there, let's look at their test scores. Then we'll look at their essays. Then we'll look at their letters. And so they kind of have to jump through those hurdles. So it is important that they do, that they are competitive. They might have amazing essays, but if, they, if their scores aren't competitive, they won't read the essays. Okay. Um, so the best predictor of college success is high school scores. So they do look at the subjects they've taken. They look at what they did at IGCSE, AS, their predicted grades. And then in their letters and in the school profile, we put all of that into context. Um, They talk about looking at rigor, how hard the courses are, and you will see that in their own research. And we have students come and go, should I take extra AP classes to show that I've got rigorous? They don't need that with A-levels. A-levels themselves are considered to be rigorous. So they pass the rigor test already. So when you see that being talked about, you don't need to worry about that. Um, and this is what I was talking about, where they look at the whole class when they're um, doing it. And they go, they go through something called panel. So there will be one reader for Thailand who will read all the Thai applications and they will shortlist who they want to put forward to the panel. And then they all sit around a table. You have the different geographical areas, if they're doing it that way, um, represented or they'll do it alphabetically. 
And then they'll take it in turn and say, well, I really want you all to read this file because this kid is brilliant. And then somebody else will say, well, I've got a very similar sounding kid. Let's compare those two. And you want them to have read the essays and go, this kid has got something about them. They've got something to say. So that they're in panel going, no, look, read this bit. I want them here because they're going to do that. And so it's finding something for them to say, which is why we work so hard on their essays with them. And this is the, the student voice is the most important element. Um, we will be... Joe will be doing a, a session with the Year 12s in a few weeks where we'll start thinking about the essays because they have to write quite a few. And we said letters of recommendation. They will have several. The classroom ones are talking about them in the classroom. We talk about them in a more holistic way of the other things that they have done and we'll work with them on that. Um, demonstrated interest is just... Um, something to make you aware of. A lot of the US schools do track demonstrated interest. And what that means is, have they shown an engagement with that school beforehand? Have they just plucked them from a list and sent an application at the last minute? Or is this somewhere that they've thought about in advance? Often, the easiest way to show demonstrated interest is to go and visit that school. That is not possible for many students who are this far away. And they understand that. So there's a number of different ways that they can do that. Um, they can sign up for newsletters on their website ahead of time. They can do, sign up for virtual tours or webinars that the international office is offering online. If that university has come to visit Harrow, they need to go and talk to them because they do take down names and they do note that. And so if they're getting an application, and remember you have the, the people visiting us, the people reading the Thai applications. So if they get an application and it says, you know, why have you chosen X school? Well, because it's my dream school and I've always wanted to go and it's perfect. And they look and they go, oh, wow, they sound great. I wonder who they were, whether I met them. And then they go back and look at their list of who they spoke to at Harrow and that student didn't bother meeting them. It doesn't ring true. Well, how much did you want to come here if you didn't even come and see me when I travelled all that way? And, or if they come and do an evening in Bangkok. Some of the US schools will only stay in Bangkok for 24 hours, so they'll do one general meet as opposed to visiting schools. So going to see them. Okay? Um, they can talk to Harrow alumni that are at schools. They can come and ask us and they can get in touch with them. There's normally a question in the supplement which says, how have you learned about our school? And that's where they're showing this as well. Who they, and if they say, I spoke to an um, admissions rep, it often then says, what was their name? To check where they have. Or um, from, an alum, uh, from a shared alumni, what is their name? So it's making sure they actually do that. Um, a lot of schools track this. Not all of them do. They are not very open about who does and who doesn't. So it's just that thinking in advance. And if they've got if there are schools that do come on the radar later on, it's no problem if they don't have this. But if there are schools that they are targeting, this is something that they can do in year 12, year 11 ahead of time. And things to strengthen their application. These are all just you know, future learner online courses. A lot of this will come into year 12 that we've spoken to them about already. For people with much younger children, don't worry too much now, they just need to enjoy school and work out what gets them excited. You know, try out different extracurricular activities, find out where their passions are is the most important thing that they can be doing early on. Um, so just to finish up the last few slides, just let you know in terms of support we offer at Harrow, each student as they move towards the end of year 12 when they finish their AS exams is allocated kind of their support team. So they will have um, a member of the counselling office who will oversee their applications, but they will also be allocated a subject specialist who can help them with choosing their courses um, and any academic essays that they have to write. Um, and then their tutor as well is on hand to support them. So they know who their go-to people are rather than just going to lots of different people for different types of advice. So they have, they're allocated their support team. Um, we work very hard with them one-to-one -one. as they move into year 13. It's a very one-to-one -one approach so that each student is getting the support that they need specifically for their applications. We have a lot of universities that come into school so that they can have that first-hand interaction. Um, and we also uh, work with Education USA um, to give that extra level of support for our students. They're the governmental organization that supports education exchange 
um, and Mike comes in and works with our students at the beginning of the year, beginning of year 13. He does workshops with them, and he's a very great source, particularly when they're choosing schools, that they can contact Mike and say, I really loved X school. Do you have any, and this is my academic profile, do you have any other suggestions of what I would like if I like that? And their knowledge of the different schools in Thailand, and we'll meet them for a coffee in Starbucks and have a chat about who they are. And they're basically looking for best fit. Um, and it's also an opportunity for the 